Hello, hello, everyone. Welcome back to another uh, Rafael Medina virtual morning report. The topic today is pulmonology and critical care. I'm particularly excited because all of the participants today are from Emory University, which is the place where I train. Dr. Uh, Shruti Gupta, Dr. Marl, and Dr. Greer are here with us today. I will let them introduce themselves shortly. Dr. Greer is actually famous in our program for being able to give lectures that are about extremely complicated topics and simplify them for all the residents to understand. And they're actually incredibly amazing. Uh, if, if you allow me to call you by your first name, Sruti, uh, do you want to introduce yourself? Sure. Hi guys, my name is Shruti Gupta. I'm a second year resident in the internal medicine program here at Emory University. I have loved my experience with pulmonology and critical care and residency so far. Um, actually finished my 28 hour call in the Emory ICU this morning um, and happy to be here with Dr. Greer and Dr. Marl who both taught me so much about ICU and pulmonology. Thank you for presenting a case after a long call. Michael, could you introduce yourself and tell us why should trainees choose palm and critical care as a future career? Sure, yeah. So my name is Mike. Um, I am now a second year pulmonary critical care fellow. And um, the reason that I love pulmonary critical care, I will actually uh, paraphrase um, some of the uh, reasons why that my mentor um, shared with me when I was first uh, starting to have an interest in pulmonary critical care. And I still feel like these reasons are true to this day. And so the number one reason is um, you have to have a love for physiology, um, whether it's the pulmonary side or the critical care side. Um, the physiology that is on display in the PFT lab, the ICU, um, is incredible. And so you have to have a love for that. Um, specifically to the ICU, if you um, are interested in really challenging conversations, but really uh, meaningful and powerful ones, um, uh, taking care of patients and families in the ICU, um, dealing with critical illness, um, are really some of the most incredible conversations that I've had in my medical career so far. Um, and then the last thing um, that I feel like is particularly true in the ICU, but pulmonary as well, internal medicine, is that you have to have a love for distilling uh, chaos into order. There is are so many things going on in the ICU. There are so many different reasons, for instance, why someone could be short of breath is that um, you have to be able to kind of uh, distill all that out, bring it into order um, so that you can help your patient. And so um, those are some of the reasons that I've really loved my pulmonary critical care fellowship so far. That is so inspiring. I love that you just came up with that on the fly. Dr. Greer, would you be able to introduce yourself and tell us why uh, residents should join Palm Crit? Sure. Um, first, because you got to wear pajamas every day to work. Um, I think you can do that in anything since COVID, but it's nice perk of the job. Um, I really like feeling competent. I feel like that was like the main reason that I decided to do it for myself. Whenever I was in the ICU, I just felt like I wanted to be my senior residents, like they could handle anything um, when they were in the ICU. And in part, that's due to because of the multidisciplinary work. So I love working with ICU nurses and respiratory therapists and pharmacists and our um nutritionists and physical therapy like I just think that's so cool to be able to work with that big of a team every day and you're like never alone and you always have support always different levels and different types of education all coming together um so I really really liked that about it I think that's a unique experience that I didn't get everywhere else in internal medicine um and I didn't want to be afraid so I felt like <laughs> if I could I don't know, like master all of that kind of stuff that I wouldn't be so afraid of it anymore. And I think it that worked. Um, but I think you go into it being like, I want control. I love the drips, the hour by hour. And then you leave realizing you don't have any control. And that's kind of like a, a different way to feel comfortable. Um, I also love systemic disease. So I didn't want to leave all the head to toe organ systems behind. And I love that like Mike and I were going through possible differentials today. I taught a differential diagnosis lecture today and it's like head to toe. We still have to think of every organ system. 
um, and not lose our knowledge that we spent so long to get in residency. Uh, I also love sleep medicine. So you can do that out of internal medicine in case anyone's interested. It's one year. Happy to talk about it if anybody wants to email me. Um, but I love sleep medicine and I feel like doing pulmonary and learning about the ventilators and that sort of thing uh, makes me a better sleep doctor because I do chronic ventilation at home. I could keep going all day, but that's the main reasons why for me. That is also so inspiring and uh... It feels like you could take on any disease and all the spectrum of it and you know how to figure it out. And I think that's very empowering. As long Marino, as you don't need surgery, I feel like I can handle it. That's amazing. Marino, if you want to share the screen and uh, we can start with the first aliquot. So uh, Dr. Marl, as you said, there's a differential for shortness of breath. That is actually our chief complaint, chief complaint of shortness of breath. Um, so we have a 56-year-old female with a history of COPD. She has chronic hypoxemic respiratory failure. Um, she's on three liters nasal cannula if you're in at home. The COPD was diagnosed about a year ago. Also has hypertension, hyperlipidemia, recurrent pneumonia, is presenting with worsening shortness of breath, greenish yellow phlegm production. She reports the shortness of breath started a few weeks ago. She went to her primary care doctor who gave her amoxicillin, but her symptoms did not improve. And now she's endorsing headaches, chills, rhinorrhea, and worsening cough. Okay, we're on to a head start. Mike, uh... Any first thoughts just with this brief aliquot and uh... yeah, absolutely. Um, and thank you, Shruti. Um, so this is a, a pretty uh, kind of rich foreground that you're providing as far as um, a middle-aged woman with a known history of COPD and has a chronic oxygen requirement. So this is somebody who, coming into this situation, doesn't have um, uh, uh, normal lungs, um, and so. Um, I think uh, when I approach shortness of breath, um, uh, I feel like the critical care side of me tends to come forward a little bit uh, first in the sense that I, I often want to kind of triage these people. Um, and so my immediate thought is, um, and as you've already started to mention, I, I really want to get a sense of the, the tempo of the, the pulmonary process that's been going on. So especially with shortness of breath, I want to know how uh, quickly has somebody felt short of breath? Uh, you know, if they were feeling fine and then um, they are severely uh, tachypnic uh, within a few minutes, that starts to uh, prompt a slightly different differential than if someone has slow progressive shortness of breath that's only brought on with exertion um, over weeks and weeks. And so I really, uh, you know, kind of wearing my triagers hat, I care about the tempo of someone's shortness of breath. Um, for instance, like if you're on the medical wards and you get called uh, by the bedside nurse that, you know, your patient is now acutely short of breath, um, you probably won't spend too much time kind of pulling up articles about, you know, the causes of hypoxemia and hypercarbia. You're probably going to go and look at your patient and see what I think is one of the most important things, which is their work of breathing. Um, and in the pulmonary world, when we talk about work of breathing, we actually uh, legitimately mean the physics definition of work, meaning kind of the force that uh, the patient is exer exerting over a certain amount of distance. Um, so what is the work of their uh, respiratory muscles? Um, and so um, it sounds like we're seeing this patient in the ED, um, and this is a, a pretty great uh one-liner about kind of uh, what the patient is coming in with, but I pretty quickly would want to know what their vitals are to start to triage them. Um, notably, the, the SpO2 and the respiratory rate. Um, and from there, you can really start, I feel like, to build a differential around shortness of breath and all the different causes. So um, after looking at the vitals, maybe you're sure that, you know, this patient doesn't need to be emergently intubated for severe uh, hypoxemia, that's refractory to non-invasive um, uh, supplemental oxygen. Um, I would then want to take the time to try to uh, get a story from the patient. Um, 
when I'm seeing uh, patients in the ED or in the clinic and they're coming uh, to our pulmonary offices for a complaint of dyspnea, um, my focus of my questions about the history are primarily uh, the two big buckets of cardiac and pulmonary disease. Um, and I would say for almost like what feels like 90% of patients, you're going to be able to find some form of pathology that could potentially explain why they're feeling short of breath within those two buckets. Um, and so then from there, I would start to kind of focus my history. And so for somebody with known COPD on three liters nasal cannula, I am particularly interested in what their home regimen is. So um, as far as uh, inhalers that they're on, I would not want to know uh, what inhalers are they using? Um, uh, what therapies have they been on in the past? Um, did they run out of oxygen or something like that? And that's why they're coming in short of breath. Um, here is a little bit concerning. It sounds like she received uh, a course of antibiotics that um, did not improve her symptoms. And so I think whenever you're seeing somebody who comes in that has already been uh, initially kind of triage diagnosed and provided a treatment but isn't responding appropriately, um, it's best to kind of take a step back, not take anything for granted, um, and have a very broad differential. Um, and so for her, uh, I, it sounds like she is describing some uh, systemic features of what could be um, within the infectious bucket of disorders, headaches, chills, worsening cough. Um, I would ask about sick contacts. I would be curious if she um, is like COVID vaccinated, what vaccinations she's had in the past, um, while we're getting some of these other objective data at the same time. I'll kind of leave it there because uh, shortness of breath is such a, um, a non-specific symptom that uh, pretty quickly I would want to start to obtain some objective data to try to further my differential. But I kind of want to throw it to Dr. Greer and see if there's other things that you have. Hello. All right. So that was great. Um, I I like to hear how everybody thinks about stuff like from the beginning when you first start hearing the words. I think that you as a fellow primarily are going to have like the inpatient you're getting called to the emergency department thought process and I think as an attending at least depending on what you do you start doing more clinic right and so you have a little bit more of like the outpatient kind of questioning things for me so I just made some notes of what if somebody's presenting this to me the the questions I have after the presentation my first question is I will put COPD in quotes with a question mark in front of it until I witness the PFTs. We believe you because you guys are presenting this to us here, but I just like, I need the proof. So I want to look and see if we've had PFTs in our system and if there's been like a reduced FEV1 PC ratio to prove it to me. I also want to know what the cause is. She's 56 and she's already on three liters of oxygen. So in Grady, we take care of a lot of patients with poorly controlled HIV. And even with well-controlled HIV, you could get HIV-related emphysema. Um, so I would want to know about that. And then the MS1 palm block teacher in me would ask about alpha-1 antitrypsin in somebody who's 56, because then I start thinking, depending on their phenotype, if they would have liver issues. And then that's leading me kind of like Mike was saying, he starts thinking about the cardiac side. I start thinking about the liver side and like pleural effusions and volume overload and all that kind of stuff. So it's just, just the word COPD, like that's where I'm already going. Three liters nasal cannula is a lot to be on baseline. So I would want to know, um, if it really is COPD, then to me, it has to be emphysema predominant if it's if that's the only cause of the oxygen requirement. And so I would want to see uh, a CAT scan. <laughs> um, if it were alpha-1 and they had a liver problem, it could be emphysema. It could also be hepatopulmonary syndrome leading to their oxygen requirement or both. And then, of course, like pulmonary hypertension of a group 3 type. So maybe they really do have COPD and then they're having group three pulmonary hypertension. And then I'm a sleep doctor. So I like always need to know if they have sleep apnea or risk factors for obesity hypoventilation syndrome, um, which would also lead them to like a group three pulmonary hypertension. And then hundred percent agree with Mike said about the, the heart stuff. Shortness of breath is heart, lungs, and heme until proven otherwise. So I would need to know if they have left-sided dysfunction also, including diastolic. And then I have to know their hemoglobin because if it's dropped a lot for any reason, 
then the shortness of breath could have absolutely nothing to do with the underlying pulmonary disease. So that's just from the, the oxygen requirement. I think Mike also mentioned he, are, he already wants to know like, okay, your three liters at home, what's your oxygen requirement now, right? Because shortness of breath, is that is that it? Or is it shortness of breath with a worsening hypoxemia? Because that's kind of two, two separate differentials. Um, I 100% agree about the timing. I just did that differential lecture today. That's the number one question. How long has it been going on? If it's weeks again, it makes me wonder about other organ systems and heme. Um, and then antibiotics didn't help. When I heard that, my first question is like, why did they give antibiotics? Someone must have obtained a chest x-ray, right? Like you're not giving, I hope, antibiotics without thinking there's a pneumonia. So I would like to see that chest x-ray. Uh, and whenever I hear about antibiotics that didn't help, I'm always going to think organizing pneumonia or undiagnosed interstitial lung disease, or I hope it's not a mass. We don't have a smoking history on this patient yet. So we need to get the smoking history. And headache, chills, and cough is the final thing that does make it sound like it's going to be an infectious situation. Um, but having this for a couple of weeks and then later developing this thing, I'm at this point, I'm not hundred percent sure what to make about it. Uh, I could go and just like list every, uh, disease that can be in your brain and your lungs, but I'm not for the sake of time, but it just makes me a little bit worried, like something that maybe was incompletely or inappropriately treated might be spreading more systemically, I guess is how I would put it. So that's where I'm at in life. Thank you. I uh, love the quotation marks, the OPD. I'm definitely gonna use that. Shruti, back to you, if you wanna give us more information. Yeah, absolutely. So what I'm hearing is there's a lot more questions. Um, so I will say when she first came, she was uh, satting 91% on her three liters, home three liters. Um, but since then, there's been a bit of a twist. So she was hospitalized for COPD exacerbation. Imaging was consistent for left lower lip consolidation with concern for community required pneumonia. Urine strep antigen was positive. She was treated with ceftriaxone and azithromycin. Her respiratory status improved back to her baseline and she was discharged. Unfortunately, she represented now with increasing shortness of breath. And kind of like you guys were asking about in terms of the timeline, um, she's been having dyspnea exertion for the past year, but um, now increasing within just the past few weeks. So in terms of her social history, she grew up in Alabama, no recent travel that she notes. She has one dog at home. She's been a little bit less active over the years. She's able to perform her ADLs, but doesn't really leave the home much because especially because she needs the oxygen. Um, no recent hot tub use, up to date on her immunizations, including COVID. She has a 15 pack year smoking history, um, but she did quit several years ago. Uh, no alcohol or other drug use. Currently, she lives with her 27-year-old daughter who helps take care of her at her home in Alabama. In terms of other information on at home, she takes amlodipine, hydrochlorothiazide, Advair, Scariba, and albuterol as needed. She follows closely with her pulmonologist and PCP. They are outside this hospital, so we do not have access to her PFTs, but she does have a pulmonologist. Um, she has a family history of hypertension and diabetes and no allergies. Thank you so much. Uh, you touched on this a little bit earlier, but in someone who has recurrent pneumonias, would you expect that just with structural lung disease or would you start thinking of uh, testing a patient for different immunodeficiencies starting with? And second question was, what do you think of someone who's just been treated for pneumonia who's coming in for worth, worsening shortness of breath? Um, yeah, it's a great question. Um, I, I completely agree that um, uh, the recurrent uh, uh, pneumonias should be concerning that there is some kind of underlying uh, immunological issue, whether it is something acquired like HIV, or if it's something that's been congenital like CVID. Um, I think it would be important to start to screen 
this person, at least um, for HIV up front to see, because um, thinking through kind of in a systematic way through, you know, uh, why is someone coming back with recurrent infections of any kind? Um, the thoughts that come to mind is, um, have we failed to uh, get source control? So for this woman who had a left lower lobe uh, pneumonia just weeks ago, um, has it evolved? It has it progressed into like a necrotizing pneumonia with a lung abscess? Is there something like, you know, now pleural disease involved with uh, empyema? Um, or um, could it have possibly, uh, so the next category of things that it makes me think is, um, did we um, not choose or uh, uh, pick our agent against the correct uh, bug? So while her strep urine antigen was positive, uh, very consistent with a, a commonly uh, community acquired pneumonia, um, could, there, could this have been a... Um, uh, uh, multi-organism uh, infection. We, we sometimes see this with like a, a pretty bad aspiration pneumonias um, where, um, you know, there can be multiple organisms that are growing out, maybe a drug resistant uh, organism as well. Um, and yeah, and so those are the things that come through my mind. And then is it is it uh, the patient themselves not able to mount a sufficient immune response uh, again, whether it's something like HIV or other kind of risk factors, you know, our lung transplant patients, um, our, uh, our patients who are receiving um, chemotherapies or uh, stem cell transplants, um, this would definitely, uh, you know, if this, this person had those backgrounds would change how I'm starting to think about what the infectious, uh, potentially infectious organism could be in this case. Uh, Dr. Gears, did you have any other thoughts? Yeah, um, I had a, one question. So we said she improved and was discharged, and then she what happened? She got brought back? Yes, yeah, so she came back with worsening shortness of breath within the last couple of weeks. Okay, so for me, okay, I'm just writing down questions as, as you all present. So uh, I still put COPD exacerbation in quotes, you know, I wasn't there. So to me, there's a definition for that. Um, and I, I will believe it, but I still, it's hard for me to always hundred percent agree unless I saw the patient, um, left lower lobe consolidation makes me want to know if that is also what she had, um, in that same location from her primary care or pulmonologist, whoever gave her the first amoxicillin, because, uh, if it's persistent in the same area, that makes me start to really worry about like malignancy or TB or like actino or, a, you know, like a slow growing situation, slower growing situation. Um, but if it's in a different place, not only do I start worrying about recurrent infectious pneumonia when like hundred percent, we would check an HIV, right? That's like the first test we get before we ever see the patient in the, in our ER, um, but I, and I agree about like earlier, you alluded to GL ILD, which would be associated with CVID, right? Um, so any sort of immune deficiency like that. Also, sometimes these patients, um, have been taking like steroids forever for their COPD. And then that actually immunocompromises them a little bit. Um, and so they're just at risk, you know, from that standpoint. Um, but the other thing that like a migratory, uh, pneumonia, it doesn't have to be infectious. It could be inflammatory. And what I mean by that would be like an organizing pneumonia. Um, and when you start to think about organizing pneumonia, then just if I only have a chest x-ray and not a CAT scan, the other things in the back of my mind are interstitial lung disease and like an NSIP pattern or a UIP, if this is like a combined emphysema, pulmonary fibrosis, or I don't know what she's doing at home. I know you said no hot tubs. She has a dog. I don't know what her bird situation is. I don't know like what her hobbies are. I'll never rule out HP. We see a lot of HP. Um, and then when I'm starting to think about granulomatous diseases, my brain starts to go to sarcoidosis because that could also present with what looks like a pneumonia, but it's really an infiltrate or I should say consolidation due to inflammation. And then when I'm thinking about granulomatous disease, I also have to think about uh, vasculitis. So like, there's just sort of a list of categories 
that we kind of go through every time. And we first do infectious stuff. And then I also have to think about the inflammatory, not infectious pneumonias. And so I think that, uh, side of things it's helpful. And of course, malignancy, uh, a malignancy that can, can really look like a, an organizing or even infectious pneumonia is an adenocarcinoma. Mike and I were talking about that today. I feel like that can masquerade, um, and get treated recurrently with antibiotics when it's actually a malignancy. Um, so yeah, I guess my questions otherwise would, I also thought like histoblasto, could it be that kind of stuff because she's from Alabama? Um, did she ever get steroids with the amoxicillin and with the ceftriaxone and that's what made her feel better and it was the steroids and not actually the antibiotics, because if she really was admitted for COPD exacerbation, high chance she got five days of steroids, right? And then that would be treating organizing pneumonia or vasculitis or sarcoidosis. Um, I'm always going to think about mycobacteria because we have a lot in our institution and that's something slow growing um, that can move around and that can be incompletely treated like MAC, especially, right? Um, and then in addition to all the other cancers that can look like a pneumonia, what if you have a carcinoid tumor in your airway? So like a bronchogenic like tumor in your airway, and then you get a post-obstructive pneumonia. Like, are we just treating a post-obstructive pneumonia over and over, but we never bronched her to find out like what's the cause of the pneumonia? All of what I just said, I like still want a CAT scan. <laughs> because I want to know if it was resolved after the first time and actually came back or if it has never resolved. That's like my main question. The other thing too, I want to add to that, uh, cause that was, uh, that was amazing, uh, is, and I'm curious to see if you feel the same way, Meredith, is that the number of pack years that she has 15, I don't feel is actually like sufficient enough to explain potentially the amount of oxygen that she's requiring, like three liters of oxygen from, uh, emphysematous destruction of the lung, um, uh, it, it requires a fair amount of smoke exposure. Um, and so maybe, you know, there's other reasons that people have COPD in the world besides just tobacco smoke, but I'm not, it, it raises my antenna a little bit to see that she's only had 15 pack years, um, that maybe there is something else going on and that the COPD perhaps um, isn't the main driver of what is going on here. I agree. And I think, um, I, I don't think it's going to be alpha one, but but you're supposed to, by the guidelines, um, check, you know, people who are younger with lower pack year history, right? You're supposed to check all those people for the COPD guidelines for alpha one, because um, smoking doesn't mean that you don't have alpha one. Smoking makes alpha one emphysema worse, right? Yeah. I 100% curious. agree. A lot of right. quotes happening with my- Yeah. I'll like add uh, like a, uh, an atypical variant of like cystic fibrosis um, uh, for somebody who's having like recurrent pneumonias at a, a later age in life um, with, a, you know, um, hypoxemia. And so, yeah, uh, I'm curious to see as we get a little bit more data. I'm sure there's a TP scan in the horizon. I love the <laughs> framework of uh, recurrent pneumonia versus recurrent pneumonia in the same location. And I love how you have a different framework for each. And I think that was a lot of learning for me. Shruti, back to you. Yeah, so I will get to the labs and the scans. But before that, you just saw her in the ED. So her vitals, her blood pressure is 108 over 80. Her heart rate is 131. Temperature is 37.7 Celsius. Respiratory rate, 24. Her oxygen, CO2, is in the 70s on her home, three liters now. Um, her BMI is 22. She's placed on high-flow nasal cannula with SiO2 of 100 to maintain SATs in the 90s. Um, so her requirements are definitely increasing. On physical exam, she is in mild distress with sinus tachycardia. She has tachypnea with increased work of breathing, accessory muscle use. She has symmetric chest rise. When you listen, you hear some coarse frails and wrong tie heard in the bilateral basis, left greater than the right, um, no J JBD, no lower extremity edema, or other signs of volume overload. Thank you, Shruti. Uh, before we go to the next aliquot, my only question is, do you have any tips and tricks for the learners uh, to do on physical exam and someone who is on a lot of oxygen?
Yeah, so um, uh, one of the first things I always do is I walk into the room, uh, in, at least in the ED where we have telemetry is, you know, I see what their SpO2 is and I see how much oxygen they're on. Um, and here clearly, um, I mean, the most prominent physical exam finding is that um, this patient is has an, uh, a high amount of work of breathing. Um, you're describing accessory muscle use, even on 100% FiO2 through a, a high flow nasal cannula, her stats are only in the 90s. Um, and so this is somebody that you immediately, you know, sick or not sick, this is somebody who's very sick. As far as um, uh, actually, you know, uh, examining the patient, um, I do want to hear what their breath sounds sound like. I want to hear, um, am I concerned that there's an obstructive process going on? Or am I hearing wheezing throughout? Is there a prolonged expiratory phase that would support some kind of obstructive process like a COPD exacerbation or an asthma exacerbation? Um, in this case, uh, we're not hearing that described. We're hearing coarse ronchi, uh, which sounds like, you know, um, uh, uh, potentially inflamed airways, uh, mucus and uh, junk in the airways, as we colloquially say. Um, and then uh, from there, you know, the cardiac exam, I think, as a pulmonologist is key as well, wanting to listen to heart sounds, wanting to look at JVD, doing a good volume exam is part of doing a good pulmonary exam. Um, and so am I seeing an elevated um, uh, uh, a jugular venous uh, pulse? Um, am I seeing lower extremity edema, sacral edema? Um, those are some of the things that I would really want to start to clue in first, but, um, even just the eyeball test for this patient, um, she does not seem to be doing well and I'm quite concerned about her. Yeah, I think, uh, my main concern as the person legally responsible for this patient's life is her airway. Um, I got to decide, I have to make a call like pretty soon, right? If we're going to tube her or not, and if that's going to be beneficial to her and think about what the downside would be. I think uh, at this point, doesn't matter if the diagnosis of COPD is in quotes or not. If that's her sat on 100% of a high flow and that's really her respiratory rate, like she's probably should be higher than that. I think she's tiring out. Like usually we see people breathing in the forties, um, which is horrible for the dead space fraction and you shouldn't leave. But, but when I see it at 24, I'm almost wondering if that's the downtrend of the restory rate. So I have to put her on a BiPAP. Like I don't even, the only exam I'm doing when I'm making that decision is the mental status and like the abdominal exam to make sure she's not like super full, super nauseous, like going to throw up into the BiPAP. And if her mental status is okay, um, I I have to buy myself time before I even care about anything else. Does that make sense? So a lot of times in, in critical care, that's what we're kind of doing is, is just doing actions to buy herself time. And that's what the emergency department does as well. So if she was stable for BiPAP and had no contraindications, I would probably just put that on her first. And then the BiPAP also helps me figure out what she can do because it's actually going to help me figure out like, like I 100% agree. Mike said it doesn't sound like wheezing, coarse ronchi. Like we need to figure out if she's really having, you know, a volume problem, like a restrictive issue, or if she's having um, an obstructive problem, like an airways resistance issue. And and putting somebody on BiPAP and getting the feedback of, feedback of the exhaled tidal volumes for a given uh, EPAP, IPAP, and, and a pressure support differential to me is really telling and helpful. It's the same thing as getting a you know plateau pressure compliance on the ventilator. Um, so I think that would be like something I do during an exam um, that also buys me time. And then I agree with everything else that Mike said. Um, I added to my to the chat, something that we should be thinking about always, which is my entire clinic specialty, which is a neuromuscular weakness. So can't rule out that she hasn't been actually having like a progressive weakness of her diaphragm or her respiratory muscles. Um, and then if you have a progressive generalized weakness, you can get dysphagia and weakening ability to cough, and then you could get a recurrent aspiration pneumonia. So like, that's a whole thing that could be going on too. And I think when I examine these people, I, you're really able to tell who is able to like really, you know, work up and use their accessory muscles to try to breathe and move their diaphragm and, and move their um, sternum and everything and who's not. And I think Mike and I talked about this earlier today, but you always, always want to make sure their abdomen and their bladder is not the cause of their respiratory distress. 
I've been called to intubate people who just had a full bladder in the PACU from anesthesia. And as soon as we put a Foley in, their respiratory distress went away. They stopped doing dead space breathing and their SATs came up. I don't think that's this lady's case. She has Ronchi, but just something to, to be aware of. And then the final thing, I think, you know, the extremities in the skin, take the socks off, look at every finger, every toe, make sure that they're not losing blood and that a lot of this respiratory rate is not driven by a metabolic acidosis. I love that. Sounds like you're screening for contraindications for BiPAP as you're seeing the patient, including altered mental status and vomiting. Uh, just for the learners who are listening as well, why would you choose BiPAP instead of any other oxygen device in this scenario, or what would be the indication for you? Uh, because I'm already on high flow and I'm desatting, and I don't have drugs to intubate yet. <laughs> and I need to figure out what the situation is. If I can buy myself any time to do that smarter and safer, I will, right? So the putting on of the BiPAP is to sort of see if you can temporize the situation so that you don't have to intubate somebody. But if you are going to, at least you're going to pre-oxygenate with a mask, with a seal. You're going to hopefully buy yourself some time to be able to get lines in, um, bring up meds, maybe do a quick, you know, pocus, make sure there's not a pneumo, make sure there's not a PE, a lot of stuff that we would want to do prior to intubating. I think the worst thing you can do is rush to intubate people and have them code on you after you induce. Thank you so much. Shruti, back to you. We're so eager for more information. Absolutely. Um, so I will say her mental status was earlier in the Oriental times four, no focal neurological deficits that uh, were noted. Her abdominal exam was also benign. Um, at some point, I do think she was placed on BiPAP, but I don't know exactly how she did on it. But at this point, she looks stable enough. Um, so we got labs. Um, popular demand lab HIV was negative. Um, other than that, her chemistry, her sodium was 139. Potassium 4.5, chloride 98, bicar 24, UN 20, creatin 0 0.7, uh, glucose 87. In terms of her um, CBC, her hemoglobin was 10.2, her white blood cell count was 12.2, platelet was 302, hematocrit 31.8. Um, her other labs I can add, by uh, bilirubin total was normal, 0.7, AST, ALT normal, um, ALKFOS also normal, albumin was 3.4, her BNP was 105, H, uh, high sensitivity troponin was 3, um, they did get a uh, venous blood gas, it was 7.46 with a partial pressure CO2 of 32, and oxygen of 24, partial oxygen 24. Lactate was 4.3. Um, her EKG showed sinus tachycardia. Her, they ended up doing a pneumococcal biofire, which came back negative. Her CRP was greater than 240. Um, she got an X-ray that showed prominent interstitial markings bilaterally left worse than the right, increased retrocardiac density, suspecting multifocal atypical pneumonia, left lower lung predominant. And also by popular demand, we do have ACT. You wanna say anything about those labs, Mike? Yeah, so um, I'll probably go through in order. Um, just to uh, try to make some uh, order out of this chaos. Um, so she has an uh, elevated white count, which um, we can start to bucket towards, you know, is there an infectious process going on? I don't know what her baseline hemoglobin is, um, but um, I, I, 
it certainly could be a component of some of her chronic dyspnea, but I, I don't think that this is likely the uh, etiology of uh, why she is feeling short of breath. Um, and then the platelet count, um, I don't make much of right now. Um, as far as her BMP, um, the thing that I'm looking at most is actually her bicarb. Um, so in somebody who has COPD and who chronically retains CO2, um, they will compensate by retaining bicarb um, to offset that acid um, that they are holding on to because of their uh, obstructive lung disease. Um, she notably has a normal uh, bicarb level of 24, um, which makes me think that she hasn't really had a uh, the severity of COPD in the first place to start to become a chronic retainer, um, or she is, and she has a, a concurrent um, like metabolic acidosis that is uh, artificially normalizing her bicarb level. Um, and then looking through um, the HIV negative definitely uh, starts to uh, change our framework of, you know, is this uh, a severely immunosuppressed patient or not potentially? Um, the VBG, um, from my perspective, uh, what I care most about is the pH and the CO2. Um, the O2 on a VBG is really hard to interpret because really what you're getting is what is the uh, O2 sat of wherever they drew from. So if that was their hand or their forearm, um, it's very difficult um, and almost meaningless to try to interpret uh, the PO2 um, off of VBG, so much so that where I did residency, um, we didn't even report the PO2 on uh, our VBGs. Um, but uh, what's most notable is that she has a respiratory alkalosis, which matches with what uh, we can see on our physical exam is that she is working to breathe, she's tachypnic, um, she is blowing off excess or, or uh, she's blowing down her CO2. Um, and it may be in response to a metabolic acidosis that she has with an elevated lactate of 4.3. Um, the chest x-ray with prominent interstitial markings um, bilaterally. Um, whenever I hear about interstitial markings, um, uh, I start to go, uh, at least if uh, they are acute interstitial markings, I start to think about um, you know fluid cells um, that could be causing that. Um, I'd be curious to see with the that finding that we get a CT so we can better characterize what's going on in the interstitial space, take a better look at this pneumonia. Um, and then, yeah, I think those are some of the main thoughts that come to my mind. I'll keep it short because I want to see the CT. Uh, we don't have baselines. I don't like that. You know what I mean? I'm just saying like, I, it's almost impossible for me to, to interpret a lab without a baseline. Uh, the white blood count, we need the EOs. We are pulmonologists. We got to get the eosinophils, right? So if we had that, that would be great. Uh, I can't comment on the hemoglobin because I don't know what her baseline is. So I don't know whether that's up or down or at her baseline. I 1 million percent agree with you about the bicarb of 24. The anion gap is 17. So doesn't matter if you have a normal bicarb, you always, always, always calculate the anion gap, even if you have a high bicarb, because it still might be lower than the patient's baseline. My cat's coming to join us. Um, so the anion gap 17, that's from the lactate, right? Um, but you just want to make sure that you work that up. Um, I think a lot of that is all going to be from the work of breathing rather than the other way around based on how this case is going. Um, but you could always be having that for another reason or glucose is normal. I don't have any reason to believe she has a beta hydroxybutyrate unless it's from starvation because she's been so short of breath she can't eat recently. Um, and then the, I agree with you, Mike, about the PO2. The PO2 on a venous gas doesn't matter. So even if if that was a central line in the neck and you were telling me that was a, a mixed venous or an SCVO2, um, it's still not the PO2, right? It's the SAT uh, that we are interested in. Um, and so for me, I just know she's needing the maximum amount of oxygen from that high flow or BiPAP. And so we know she's hypoxemic with an AA gradient. Uh, I'm not going to comment on the chest x-ray because I know I'm going to get a CT. So I'll just wait for that. This is a recording of the CT in the long window. This is a CTPE that people were asking for.
and we can give you the read as well if you want to yeah. come in. Would you mind playing it one more time? Can you like freeze it where it's like halfway through, pause it maybe? Like where, even in the top would be fine, just so we can give you guys an example of the lung findings. Mike, you can just start by saying like, yeah, the CT. So yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, so as Shruti mentioned, um, you can see that this is a uh, uh, a CT uh, PE study with contrast that is phased to um, illuminate the uh, pulmonary ar arterial tree. Um, and with that, whenever I'm approaching any CT of the chest, um, whether it's, you know, a PE study without, with contrast, um, I tend to try to break it down in a systematic way, much like um, we're often taught on how to approach a chest X-ray. Um, and especially when there's so much going on within a single CT, um, it's really helpful so that you don't feel like you miss anything. Um, I usually start... Um, uh, and we don't have to necessarily do it here, but um, just to say out loud, I usually start with the mediastinal windows to take a look at the lymph nodes um, uh, along uh, uh, the trachea, down along uh, higher lymph nodes, the different stations, and see if there's any associated lymphadenopathy going on with um, uh, uh, whatever process is uh, most predominant, which here it looks like uh, consolidation and ground glass opacities. Um, and then uh, in the lung windows, I like to follow the airways down, um, going, scrolling back and forth, following into each of the five lobes, um, really just to try to make sure that, uh, you know, I'm appreciating, is there mucus plugging? And do we uh, lose an airway uh, going down into this left lower lobe? Um, is there bronchiectasis? Um, is there bronchial wall thickening? All of these things will add to the differential when you're reviewing a, a CT scan. Um, and then after I review the airways, I go through and take a look at the lung parenchyma. And I try to say, you know, there often can be uh, multiple different findings within the parenchyma, um, uh, much like in this setting. But I try to at least comment and say, like, what is the most predominant feature? Is it uh, nodules? Is it reticulations? Um, is it uh, ground glass opacities, consolidations? And that starts to at least help me try to make sense of um, what could be a very busy uh, uh, CT in the first place. Um, and then uh, after looking at the um, parenchyma, I usually take a quick look at the pleura, make sure there's nothing in the pleural space, like uh, effusions, loculated effusions, pleural thickening. Um, these can start to uh, prompt different and diagnoses as well. And then notably in this study, we um, are able to get a, a, a very good look at the uh, pulmonary vasculature um, to see is there a PE in the mix of all of this. Um, and so I'd say for her, it looks like there is um, bilateral uh, patchy ground glass um, and uh, consolidative opacities with a predominant uh, consolidative focus in the left lower lobe. I would be curious to see if um, uh, if we lose some of these airways going down in the left lower lobe, as if they're uh, either mucus plugged um, or obstructed. Um, again, thinking back to why does she have recurrent pneumonias? Why do they seem to be focused in that same left lower lobe? Is there something in the airways? Um, and so, yeah, that's kind of my general approach. Shruti, was the official read similar? Wait, don't tell me yet. Oh, yeah. well, okay, we won't. Okay. We don't like the official read. I'm just kidding. We love it, but we like to guess ourselves first, right? So the way that I learned to read was I did exactly like Mike and I have like a pattern and I do it every time and I write down for myself, like I'm doing a pretend report because that's when I did my radiology rotations. That's what the attendings would make me do. And then they would make me present my pretend report and then we would compare what I got right, what I missed. So that's what I do now. And I still do it and I go and then you learn so well, like the stuff that you just completely blew off or you missed and you start to learn the terminology better by trying to use radiology term terminology yourself. So um, I agree with Mike. I think there's a lot of ground glass. And I think especially if you can get up a little bit 
I guess while we're here on this slice, I will point out, I do not believe that there is anything in the plural space. And, and you really shouldn't be evaluating that on a lung window. And I believe it takes many years and many CTs of looking at stuff to sort of just feel that vibe. But personally, I'm not feeling that there is stuff in the plural space. I'm almost certain that that is a consolidation and that we are seeing air bronchograms go into that um, left lower lobe a little bit down there. Um, and it looks pretty socked in to me. I, I almost see a pericardial effusion on this window too, which you're not supposed to do. You really should be looking at that on the mediastinal windows, but it just makes me wonder about other systemic things. Um, and also especially like malignancy, if there could be some sort of, um, like infiltration. So if you go up a little bit here, you're going to see that it gets more ground glass, less consolidated, and it's still left-sided predominant. Um, but I think if you go up um, on the scan toward the apex, you're going to see inner lobular thickening. I saw it for like one second, but I think you're going to. Um, and so when you think about ground glass, there's five things that we want you to think about. Okay. So we think about ground glass. You want to think about water. That'd be pulmonary edema. Blood, that would be alveolar hemorrhage. Um, pus, that would be infection. Cells, that would be like inflammation or malignancy. And then protein, which would be pulmonary alveolar proteinosis, okay? So those are the five things that you have to put on your differential every single time that you see ground glass. Um, and then just like Mike said, when you start to think about your differential, you've got to make a understanding of the anatomy, right? So are we affecting the airways? Are we affecting the parenchyma? Are we affecting the uh, lymphatics? And so if you go up and if you can see in that left upper area, I think there's interceptal thickening. And to me, that makes me worried that something is like filling the lymphatics or the venous drainage. Um, and so it could just be that there's backup of fluid, but it could also be a sign of malignancy or lymphangitic carcinomatosis. Um, this has been here for a long time. Antibiotics haven't totally gotten rid of it. It does not have the classic appearance of organizing pneumonia, which is usually more round and has uh, an atoll sign, um, which is like a reverse halo. Uh, I am very worried about a, a, the mucinous adeno that I'm always worried about or some sort of multifocal adenocarcinoma that is sort of uh, masquerading as a, a persistent infection. It doesn't look tree and bud, right, Mike? It doesn't yeah. look like a classic TB. Um, yeah, it's hard for me to say without being able to scroll up and down and flipping to the mediastinal windows, but I think that's some of the stuff that I'm worried about. What what next steps would you want for this patient? Um, like for diagnosis? Yeah, like in general, if you saw the CT scan, what would what next workup would you want or what would be your plan? Yeah, Mike, what do you want? Yeah, so I mean, going back to kind of one of the first things we were talking about when someone comes in with dyspnea is like triaging the patient. So, I mean, this, we now see why she has such severe hypoxemia. She has a significant amount of um, uh, alveolar filling uh, uh, defects uh, throughout um, uh, predominantly the left lung, but also the right. And so she is having, you know, VQ mismatch and shunting, and she is on 100% FiO2 and doesn't seem to be thriving. And so my concerns would be that we may be moving clinically towards an intubation. Um, that can be challenging, but what it would potentially offer as well is an avenue to get further diagnostic workup. And for somebody with recurrent infection, concern for recurrent pneumonias, I would be very curious to try to get, you know, whether it was um, uh, a tracheal aspirate from an ET tube, or if we could actually do like a mini BAL or a bronch to see if we can get further infectious workup, send it for the routine respiratory culture, um, fungal panel, AFB, um, and then also I would send it for a, you know cell count and differential again, trying to look for um, outside of an infectious etiology, if this was say like an autoimmune condition, um, you can start to get a little bit more information from a bronchoalveolar lavage cell count and differential. And so 
those are where my immediate thoughts are going is we need to get uh, we need to get some samples to tell us what exactly is going on in these lungs. Mike, what's the over under on the chances you're going to order the full autoimmune panel just to make sure that you don't miss a myositis related early ILD socked in lung? Yeah, we do it often um, just because I think probably, uh, I mean, even, uh, you know, a year into my pulmonary critical care fellowship, uh, I've been surprised by um, the patient who seemingly doesn't, doesn't present in a way that I would think would be consistent with like a connective tissue ILT, but lo and behold, this all started as, um, you know, uh, uh, an autoimmune ILD that then progressed and they're at risk for like, you know, uh, aspiration pneumonia or recurrent pneumonia. And so I don't think it would be unreasonable and I see it clinically that we do it often. Thank you both. Shruti, back to you. Yeah, so um, very close to the final read. Um, the final read was no pulmonary embolus, embolus uh, consolidative opacity within the, deep, within the dependent left lung and diffuse ground glass opacities with smooth interlobular septal thickening, bindings consistent with pneumonia and possible developing alveolar damage. There was also a right upper lobe pulmonary nodule containing calcifications and central fat that could represent a hematoma. Uh, at the time of pulmonary critical care, attending also read over the CT scan and was concerned about chronic issues like organizing pneumonia, but also saw signs of underlying fibrosis and diffuse alveolar damage, some things that we also talked about. Um, at the time, there was concern for ILD. She was treated with a stereotaper and PJP prophylaxis. Um, some of her labs came back, respiratory culture was negative. Um, she got rheumatoid factor and CCP, ANA, DSDNA, and the myositis panel, all of which were negative. Um, she was followed for a while. Her hypoxia and findings on imaging did not improve during the hospitalization for multiple weeks, despite multiple antibiotic regimens, steroids, different modes of treatment. Um, in terms of the fungal workup, it was also negative. Eosinophils were zero. Uh, COVID was also negative. Um, she got that whole biofire, pneumococcal biofire that was negative earlier. We did get a CT scan one month later that essentially showed very little changes in disease. Um, at the time, the impression was there was a background of pulmonary emphysema with superimposed ground glass opacities and septal line thickening and mild bronchial dilation also associated dependent consolidations as well, findings suggest with underlying diffuse alveolar damage or organizing pneumonia lung injury. Um, consolidation within the bilateral lower lobe likely represents combination of atelectasis and pneumonia. So essentially it's been a month and not much has changed. What do you think, Mike? I'm sorry, did you say we were able to get a biopsy? She's been too sick. We have not done the biopsy yet. Yeah, that's where. And then did we do a bronch on her ever during this? Like even a BAL that we could send for cytology? So I can jump down to the next Alex. I'll just give you more information. I don't know, Mike. I mean, right at this point, here's yeah. what we can say. What, what, why don't you tell us what you think it's not? Because uh, that I don't... might be easier at this point, right? Yeah, um, so I would be concerned uh, for uh, potentially some form of malignancy. You know, you have a unresolving, sucked and consolidated, uh, uh, kind of um, collapsed uh, left lower lobe. And so, um, yeah, I mean, at this point, if our infectious workup is coming back negative, um, not responding as we would expect from an organizing pneumonia perspective to steroids, which tends to be a very steroid responsive condition. Um, again, like, uh, I think we need more information. And so a biopsy would be warranted. Um, I don't know if there was discussion about like a, a potential PET CT or if like on a repeat CT scans, it seemed like there was an area that would uh, potentially be a viable target for biopsy. I mean, when you're choosing a site to biopsy, you don't want to go after, you know, old fibrosis. That's not going to show you anything kind of active about, you know, whether it's ILD or malignancy. Um, 
but I'd be curious if like a pet CT was considered versus going for, you know, whether it would be a uh, bronchoscopic uh, guided um, lung biopsy or like a, a surgical lung biopsy. Yeah, I think you're totally right. I mean, it's been long enough. It's not an infection. Whether or not she's getting uh, superimposed hospital infections, that's a different story, right? Uh, it's very unlikely to be an inflammatory pneumonia that didn't respond to any of those things. I put in the chat, an eosinophilic should also respond amazingly, right, to steroids. Things that don't respond to steroids are things like AFOP, the acute fibrinous organizing pneumonia, uh, and then like sometimes the AIP, acute interstitial pneumonia, which we never find really a reason for. And then certain ones of the myositis related antisensitase syndromes, um, namely like PL12 and the MDA5. And she was negative for that. So those are the other inflammatory things that don't typically respond to steroids that we may try to do like rituxan, cytoxan for, but we didn't have any evidence. It looks like with antibodies to make us think one way or the other. I think when you get to this point, it's been so long and the person's still not getting better, it, there, it's almost impossible for it to not be a malignancy on the top of your list. And then I think when you think about the pulmonary malignancies and what they look like, I don't know. I, it just has, it doesn't look like squamous, right? Like it's never cavitated, right? It's hard for mm. me to believe that it would be a small cell or a squamous cell. Yeah. And I, I would lean, uh, my thoughts are leaning towards uh, bronchoscopy also just to evaluate the airways to see like, you know, is there truly like an endobronchial lesion that is obstructing the airways um, uh, that could also be easily biopsied um, and uh, much lower risk than, you know, sending someone immediately for a VAT surgical lung biopsy. I agree. And I would take a BAL and just do what I could to get a um, cytology on it. And then you could ask a uh, path to do next generation sequencing for uh, a non-small cell, like if you thought it was adeno, if you got enough fluid. Seems like you're both thinking very much malignancy as top on your differential. And Shruti, back to you. Yeah, so um, I think it's essentially time for the reveal. Uh, bronchoscopy with biopsy was pursued. It was negative for malignancy. Another wedge biopsy of the lingula in the left lower lobe was pursued that showed multifocal atypical adenoma mm -hmm. adenomatous hyperplasia. The case was discussed in detail in conferences for organizing pneumonia versus malignancy. And eventually, re-review of the pathology showed multifocal adenocarcinoma in situ of the lung. She was essentially given one cycle of chemotherapy inpatient, however, ended up developing fevers, had a se severe decline in clinical and performance status, ended up having multiple complications at her hospital course, including a perforated diverticulum, multiple ICU admissions for hypoxic respiratory failure, VRE pneumonia, splenic abscess, encephalopathy, gall uh, GI bleed, shock. Ultimately, the family chose comfort care and she passed away peacefully. Um, but yeah, malignancy. Thank you so much, Shruti, for presenting this amazing case. How was it caring for this patient? Did you have any reflections? Yeah, absolutely. I think um, this case was particularly interesting for a couple of reasons. A lot of them, based on what Dr. Gurian and Dr. Merle talked about, that it was interesting to really work up and figure out what was going on. Um, but the things I can take away from it is, A, the importance of a broad differential. I think, you know, as I progress in my training, I'm starting to see the same common presentations over and over again, like COPD and COPD exacerbation. And sometimes it's so easy to focus on those horses that if a zebra does pop up, it's really hard to catch if you're not prepared for it and are not thinking about that broad differential, which we worked on a lot today. Um, and the effects of not catching those zebras can sometimes be really devastating for patients. Um, and then I took some time also to read about like multifocal adenocarcinoma to see, um, is it commonly presented like this or what happens? And it kind of reiterated to me the importance of routine lung cancer screening for high-risk populations. Um, 
per the International Association for the Study of Lung Cancer, the average five-year survival for multifocal ground glass nodules or lipidic tumors is actually 85% which is pretty higher than I expected. And it's often those uh, nodules are caught during screening and each lesion is able to be resected, which leads to that high um, survival rate. So in prior described cases, another interesting thing was that resection and mutation analysis can even bring into question whether it's like multiple primary tumors that are happening because of field cancerization or um, essentially like smoking history, things like that or if it's really like this metastatic disease where one nodule has progressed to both sides of the lung. Um, all in all to say that if caught early, there's options. And so um, it was really interesting to see this case. Yeah, thank you so much. Did you all have any reflections on final diagnosis and in general? Um, yeah, thank you, uh, Shruti. This was a fantastic presentation. It sounds like it was a very challenging case, but having worked with you before, I know that, um, you know, this patient uh, was definitely better off under your care. And so I'm glad that you were able to help take care of her. Um, overall, I mean, I think this is, you know, a great reminder uh, to me as well um, as a trainee to, you know, never uh, kind of anchor or, you know, close on a diagnosis too early and say, this is another COPD and another pneumonia. Um, there's very much a, a scenario where she could have gone to um, another hospital and been treated similarly with another round of, you know, steroids and antibiotics, COPD exacerbation, um, and not got the diagnosis that, you know, uh, truly uh, could have potentially you know, helped her. And so um, I think constantly always questioning, you know, what is your work of diagnosis, even this late into the uh, disease course, um, is just a great reminder of that. I think that in my time uh, in residency, I learned that it could always be sarcoid. And I think in fellowship, I learned it could always be multifocal adeno. I just think I think that Mike asked the correct question. The very first thing that came out of your mouth was what's the timeline? And I think there are very few severe parenchymal pulmonary diseases that can have this long of a course, right? Without ending sooner in mortality. And so I think having a good idea of the uh, like half-life of diseases, I don't know if that's a term, right? But having a PE has like the short half-life, then a bacterial problem, then a fungal, then a mycobacterial, then an inflammatory process, which would be a vasculitis, followed by a connective tissue disease, interstitial lung disease, right? Followed then by a COPD emphysema, followed then by malignancy. And I think that's like, you know, and I think it's a helpful timeline to have, and it's probably true for every organ system. Um, but that can really help you not hone in on the wrong thing and, and broaden your differential. So I think that's a good takeaway from this case. And to be best friends with your pulmonary pathologist and your radiologist. And that just goes back to the whole reason why I did this job in the first place, because it's interdisciplinary and I love it. I wanted to thank you all so much for joining us today. Uh, you're actually role models for everyone joining. This was an amazing discussion. I think we all learned very, very much. Uh, thank you everyone for joining and hope you have a wonderful Monday. <laughs>